Good afternoon. Welcome uh, to Grand Rounds today. I wanted to uh, remind you that there is no Grand Rounds program next week. Uh, also, I wanted to remind you to uh, fill out the attendance record, the back of the auditorium, and also uh, to fill out the program evaluation uh, and leave those uh, uh, with us when you leave the auditorium. And if you could give us any ideas in regards to future speakers uh, or future topics, we would appreciate that. Uh, today, I have the uh, pleasure of uh, introducing Dr. Vinaya Simha. Uh, Dr. Simha is board certified in internal medicine, uh, endocrinology, uh, diabetes, and metabolism, and uh, also is a board certified clinical lipidologist. Uh, he's been uh, extensively published in the field of uh, diabetes and endocrinology, and uh, currently is assistant professor of uh, medicine at the Mayo Clinic School of Medicine, and he was uh, kindly, or was kind enough to drive down today to uh, provide us with some updates on the new lipid guidelines. So uh, please join me in uh, welcoming Dr. Simha. Thank you very much. Uh, it is indeed a great pleasure and privilege for me to be here this afternoon. I really thank you for this invitation and also for the opportunity. And uh, so we will be talking about the new lipid guidelines. And so I have titled my talk as the good, the bad, and the ugly. Uh, I don't have any disclosures. But then there is something that I need to confess right off in the beginning, and uh, that is that I'm not really a big fan of old Western action movies. I never did my Louis Lammers when I was a kid, and uh, I've not really seen this movie. And so I was trying to find out a little bit more about this movie uh, through the internet. And when I was doing this, I understand that there has been a more recent Clint Eastwood starrer, which also involved somebody who was either good or bad or ugly. I don't know. The chair was empty, so nobody knows. But then the internet also tells me that people, the good people in Iowa, more specifically the good people in Ames, Iowa, are tasked with the job of picking out the president. So I think that uh, that's probably the main reason why I could not resist using this as an introductory segue to a talk on lipids. And in some ways, I think this is unfortunate that the new lipid guidelines have lent themselves to so much of uh, political criticisms and political innuendos. And um, we'll try to as much as possible steer away from things like that as we uh, I'll try to avoid at least the political rancor that has surrounded these lipid guidelines and we'll just try to sift through what are what is good about these guidelines and what is probably not so good so the broad learning objectives are these so we will first get an get a bird's eye overview of these the new 2013 American College of Cardiology the American Heart Association guidelines on this is not guidelines on treatment of dyslipidemia, but these are guidelines on the treatment of blood cholesterol to reduce atherosclerotic cardiovascular risk in adults. And then we'll review the differences between these new guidelines and the earlier ATP3 guidelines. And then look at the controversies that have arisen both in terms of the new treatment recommendations and also the risk assessment strategies. Finally, we'll take a deep breath, step back, and see how we can adopt these guidelines to improve patient outcomes and satisfaction. You know, I'm always fascinated that, you know, being physicians, being people who pride ourselves in, uh, in, in being involved in a profession that is involved in both the science and art of medicine, we hanker after guidelines. And the powers that be have always obliged us by giving us enough and more of these guidelines, whether or not we follow them. Um, that is not in any way to belittle the great work that has been done by the NHLBI in issuing the lipid guidelines, the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute. That has constituted the NCEP, the National Cholesterol Education Program. And the National Cholesterol Education Program has really done human service in this field. It has analyzed the data from all the available trials at that time and has come out with the adult treatment panel recommendations. The first ATP recommendation came out in 1988 and primarily focused on lifestyle intervention for people with established heart disease. This was based on the available epidemiological trials that were then. And subsequently, over the years, as more and more of these trials became available, they have synthesized all this data and, came and have come out with updated guidelines. And as you are well aware, as the guidelines have evolved, so have the recommendations for more intensive treatment. So, in 2006 was when the latest update for the ATP3 guidelines were, uh, uh, were, uh, were, were established, were rather issued. And you're 
probably well aware of what this entails. So this was the ATP3 therapeutic goals and treatments. So we won't go into the details of this, as you know. So it essentially involved categorizing patients based on their risk to either being very high risk or moderate risk and so on. And then for each of these risk categories, the panel identified a goal LDL cholesterol. And it also identified a threshold LDL cholesterol at which to initiate both drug therapy and also to initiate the therapeutic lifestyle changes. We have heard of these numbers ad nauseum, so I won't spend any time on that. Now, it is not just simply the ATP3 which has done this, so not just the NCEP, but we have had our Canadian guidelines, and then we have had our European cousin, so everybody has come out with their own set of numbers. So the, and by and large, what it all meant was, in order to reduce the risk, you were advised to move the cholesterol number from point A to point B. And this is where the new guidelines offer a paradigm shift. So it does not want us to be hung up on the numbers anymore. And uh, I think that is very much to their credit. And I think there is much merit to doing this approach. We'll get to these details shortly. But then we'll start by looking at how these new guidelines were developed. So in 2008, the, uh, the NHLBI constituted the ATP4 panel. And uh, as, these, as this panel went on with its deliberations in 2011, so the advisory committee of the NHLB, they, they were influenced by the Institution of Medicine, which then, which then published its own guidelines on how to write good guidelines. And the focus then was all on high quality evidence, basically randomized controlled trials. And so the advisory board of the NHLBI, so they, they advised the ATP4 to focus primarily on randomized controlled trials and also to partner with other organizations to develop the guidelines. They wanted this to come out of a broad base so that there is wider acceptability. And indeed, in uh, June of 2013, the NHLBI initiated collaboration with the ACC and AHA and many other organizations to complete and publish the guidelines. And in November of 2013, the guidelines were published. And within a few minutes of these guidelines actually being published, we had many of these stakeholder organizations coming out with their vehement denial, saying that we don't support these guidelines and that we don't want to be part of this. In fact, I learned that the guidelines were published when I received an email from the National Lipid Association saying that they don't support the guidelines. So, so, unfortunately, the birth of these guidelines was very painful, at least the introduction. Now, the panel also wants us to stay tuned. Much of the data that has been analyzed that led to the publishing of these guidelines, so they, they only looked at data till 2012. So they have promised that as more data becomes available and is analyzed, they will issue further updates, and so we need to watch out for those. What was the methodology for the development of these new guidelines? The expert panel, they identified critical questions which were relevant to clinical practice. And the three primary questions that they looked at was, what is the evidence that is available to support the adoption of an LDL or a non-HDL cholesterol goal for either secondary prevention or primary prevention? And what is the evidence that is available for the impact of specific lipid-lowering drugs? So in plain speak, this just means, do we have evidence that statins, when used to lower LDL cholesterol from A to B, is effective, or whether non-statins are effective? So that's the, those were the critical questions that clinicians always grapple with. They also set the ground rules on where you look for this information. So the focus had to be on RCTs, randomized control trials, and large meta-analysis of these RCTs. The actual job of searching for this information was entrusted to an independent contractors. And these independent contractors performed a systematic electronic search of the literature from 1995 to 2009. And this led to generation of evidence statements. And the expert panel then synthesized these evidence statements into treatment recommendations. What are these treatment recommendations? This is a broad 30,000 feet overview of the new ACC guidelines. So top on the list, they encourage adherence to healthy lifestyle. 
And then they have recommended the adoption of a new pooled cohorts risk equation to estimate the 10-year atherosclerotic cardiovascular risk. They then identify four major groups of patients who will benefit from statin therapy. And in these four groups of patients, they advocate initiation of appropriate intensity of statin therapy. They did not find any evidence for treating to a particular goal LDL or non-HDL cholesterol. They also have very little evidence for using non-statin therapies. So this in jest is actually what the new guidelines are all about. Let's go into a little bit of detail about each one. So about the healthy lifestyle. Now, right off the bat, the panel makes all the right noises about healthy lifestyle. They reiterate the fact that a healthy lifestyle is the foundation for cardiovascular health. The recommendations are not anything new. Most of us have probably tried to do this most of the time. So they emphasize a diet that is low in saturated fat, trans fat, and sodium. They want us to eat our veggies and fruits and nuts. Stay away from the, from the soda pop, get regular aerobic exercise at least 150 minutes a week, avoid smoking, maintain healthy weight. None of these are controversial, and I think uh, they have kind of slipped under the radar. This is where the story gets a little interesting, and that is about the new pooled cohort risk equation. Now, why do we even need a new risk equation? We have already had plenty of these. We have the Framingham risk, we have the Lloyd-Jones, we have the UKPDS risk estimator. Why then do we need another estimator? So the panel actually feels that the limitations of the current widely used Framingham ATP3 risk assessment model is, primarily the data here is derived exclusively from a white population. So it might not be applicable to a more diverse races, and also there's a limited scope of outcome in that what the Framingham equations they assess is the risk for coronary heart disease, not for other atherosclerotic vascular events. Therefore, what the panel did was, so they developed this new equation based on data that was available from five large racially and geographically diverse longitudinal cohorts. These are the ones, the ERIC and the CARDIA, the Framingham heart and the Framingham heart offspring cohorts. And this was then validated in two independent contemporary cohorts. And one of the main advantages of this is, so they estimate not just CHD endpoints, but also other hard atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease events, that is CHD death, non-fatal MI, and stroke. So the old risk is, uh, engines that we had did not estimate the risk for stroke. Whereas here, we have a comprehensive assessment of all the hard cardiovascular endpoints that we are trying to prevent. Uh, those of you who have used this equation know that these are the variables that are used, the age, total and HDL cholesterol, blood pressure, diabetes, and the current smoking status. Well, as I said, the main one of the main advantages is that this is race specific. Now, this is not entirely true. This is true if you are either white or African-American. If you are Hispanic or you belong to any of the other races, then we will have to use the sex-specific equations for the Caucasians. But at least the good thing is that for African-Americans, we now have race and sex-specific equations which are available to estimate the risk. How frequently should you estimate risk? Now, the panel recommends that in adults aged 20 to 79 years, who do not have established uh, vascular disease, then the risk estimation is recommended every four to six years. Now, they also speak of a lifetime risk estimation or a 30-year risk estimation. And uh, so this is recommended in people who are 20 to 59 years and have a low 10-year risk. Unfortunately, the panel doesn't go so far as to recommend drug therapy based on the assessment of the 30-year or the lifetime risk. And I think this is one of those places where they miss the, uh, where at least to my mind, I think they could have done a little bit more. So you do estimate the 30-year risk, but you use this only to counsel the patient on lifestyle changes, not on drug therapy. The next thing is about the identification of groups of patients who will benefit from statin therapy. Which are these? These are the indications for statin therapy. The first group is patients for, who have already had established 
vascular disease. So secondary prevention in these group of patients, so this is of course the least controversial of them. So these are patients who already have had an ACS or myocardial infarction, revascularization, stroke, TIA, peripheral vascular disease. These patients clearly benefit from statin therapy. The second group is primary prevention in those whose LDL cholesterol is over 190. Essentially, these are patients who, who have suspected familial hypercholesterolemia. The third would be primary prevention in diabetics. This is both type 1 and type 2 diabetes who are aged 40 to 75 years and have an LDL cholesterol between 70 to 189. And finally, the fourth group is those who don't fit into any of the above three. So primary prevention in those who are aged 40 to 75 years without diabetes and with a 10-year cardio estimated cardiovascular risk of greater than 7.5%. And this is what has generated the greatest controversy, and we'll talk about this. Now, of course, the devil is always in the details, so that those are that's what is in the in the bold. Now, what about the fine print? So, uh, one of the good things about these guidelines is they emphasize quite a bit about uh, about involving in a clinician-patient discussion on the potential for risk reduction, adverse effects, drug-drug interaction, and patient preference before starting statin therapy. But this is where it gets a little tricky. Now, besides these four groups, they do say that there is moderate evidence to support statin therapy for primary prevention in those whose risk is between 5 to 7.5%. So about 7.5%, they feel is clearly yes, they benefit. And perhaps even in those who have between 5 to 7.5%. And going on, even in some of those whose risk is even less than 5%, if their LDL cholesterol is over 160, or if there is evidence for genetic dyslipidemia, if there is family history of premature heart disease, if the CRP is over 2 milligrams per deciliter, this of course is based on the Jupiter study, or if the coronary artery calcium score is over 300 or greater than the 75th percentile, or if the ABI, the ankle brachial index, is less than 0 0.9. So essentially, you don't want to miss out people who have evidence for subclinical atherosclerosis. That's what the CAC score and the ABI is going to see. And for people who have high vascular inflammation, or people who have family history of premature CAD, basically people who have genetic predisposition to heart disease. And routine initiation of statin therapy is not indicated in, one, hemodialysis patients, two, people with heart failure class two to four, and primary prevention in those over 75 years of age. So this in broad are the patients who would benefit from statin therapy and who would not benefit from statin therapy. Once you identify that, then you initiate appropriate intensity of statin therapy there is no evidence for treating to a particular goal. So what is appropriate intensity of statin therapy? So they differentiate between high intensity, moderate intensity, and low intensity. High intensity statin therapy would be statin therapy that would be expected to cause at least greater than 50% reduction in LDL cholesterol from baseline. And this would be achieved by using either atorvastatin 40 to 80 milligrams or rosuvastatin 20 to 40 milligrams. Moderate intensity statin therapy would be LDL cholesterol reduction of 30 to 50 percent. And these are the usual doses of medications that we commonly use to get this. Low intensity would be something like simvastatin 10 milligrams or provastatin 10 to 20 milligrams. They actually do not recommend low intensity statin therapy in anybody unless patient cannot tolerate moderate intensity statin therapy. So how do we use this in these four different groups? So in the first group of patients, that is the secondary prevention in patients with established vascular disease, if the age is less than 75 and there are no safety concerns, then there is a class one recommendation to use high intensity statin therapy. Whereas if age is over 75 or if there are some safety concerns, then moderate intensity statin therapy is recommended. What about the second group, that is patients with an LDL cholesterol over 190? Again, if the age is over 21, and then you don't have any concerns about statin toxicity, then you would use high intensity. 
They, now, many of these patients, it would be very hard to get meaningful cholesterol reductions, even with high-intensity statin therapy. So if you do not get at least a 50% reduction from baseline, then they do say you could consider additional non-statin therapies. So the level of evidence here is quite poor. It is C, and this is just a 2B recommendation. What about patients with diabetes? So again, for, they, they recommend moderate intensity statin therapy for primary prevention. However, if the estimated 10-year risk is over 7.5%, then they would recommend high intensity statin therapy. And for primary prevention, in those who do not belong to any of these three groups, they would recommend either moderate or high intensity, primarily depending upon how high the risk is. So once again, the panel makes no recommendations for or against specific LDL cholesterol or non-HDL cholesterol targets for the primary or secondary prevention of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. Now, this is just being politically correct, but you know the spirit of the paper is do not use this LDL or non-HDL cholesterol targets. But then again, this is very interesting. As I said, the, the, the devil is in the details. So if you look at, so it's not that they recommend that, okay, you identify somebody who will benefit from statin therapy, you initiate the appropriate intensity of statin therapy, and then forget. No. They would still want you to monitor the response. And while we don't really look at whether we have reached a particular goal, LDL cholesterol, they do introduce this term of, have we seen the anticipated therapeutic response? And what if you don't see this anticipated therapeutic response? Well, you go around about where, but ultimately where you end up is here. You still can consider addition of non-statin drug therapies. So even though the general perception, and I think the general spirit of the paper is that we want to simplify therapy, we just want to identify those who will benefit from statin therapy, give them appropriate intensity of statin therapy, and there ends the story. Well, it really doesn't end there, okay? So if you get into the bubbles of the paper, so you know they will say that if you don't get the so-called anticipated response, then you can still use additional non-statin drug therapies. And so it, they, they leave the back door open and there is some gray area here. Now, I want to spend the rest of the time in actually patient-centered discussions. I think that will probably drive home the message much better, okay? So let's actually... Um, you know, I'm, uh, so you can get your clickers ready. So, you know, so I want to, I want, now there are no right answers or wrong answers. This is just to facilitate a discussion. So, to which of these following patients would you not recommend statin therapy? You know, the flavor of the times is it's not about who needs statin therapy, it is who doesn't need statin therapy, okay? So here's the first one. So I have a 68-year-old gentleman. He's completely asymptomatic, fit as a fiddle, no diabetes, no hypertension, does not smoke, he's not on any medicines, and these are his lipids. His cholesterol is 147, triglycerides 90, HDL is 55, his LDL cholesterol is 74. Would you give him a statin? Number two, 40 years old, also asymptomatic, blood pressure is slightly high, and then he has impaired fasting glucose. He's also not a smoker. He has combined dyslipidemia. He's got elevations in total cholesterol, triglycerides, HDL is low, and his LDL cholesterol is 158. Third, 61-year-old lady with rheumatoid arthritis, has well-controlled hypertension, no diabetes, former smoker. These are her lipids. Her LDL cholesterol is 122. And fourth, is a 39-year-old lady with type 1 diabetes for 12 years, has stage 3 CKD, hypertension is on treatment, and these are her lipids. Her LDL cholesterol is 104. Okay. So to which of these would you not recommend a statin therapy, or would you not recommend statin therapy to any of them? Okay, please vote. Uh, sorry. I... Hmm. I'm not sure if the turning point is working. It's okay, all right. Um, if we 
good. That's um, that's fine. Okay, if we can't vote, that's all right. Okay. So uh, anyway, the um, I just wanted to know what you thought of. Uh, let's see. So the first guy. Okay, would 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 you? Um, Okay, so would you would you actually give statin to this gentleman? Okay, somebody who looks who looks healthy. His LDL cholesterol is seventy four. His HDL is fine. Everything is fine. So would you have given him a statin? No. Okay. So what about this one? This is young. Has combined dyslipidemia. Has probably the metabolic syndrome. Would you give him a statin? He's forty. Has an LDL of one fifty eight. Yeah, perhaps, maybe. Let's see. What about this person with rheumatoid arthritis? That's one of the things that the actually the guidelines miss. So you know, in patient treatment in special populations. So we know that patients with uh, all kinds of inflammatory disorders, including rheumatoid arthritis, they are at very high cardiovascular risk, and perhaps we greatly underestimate their risk with the current equations. And so you can make a case for probably treating her as well. Then what about this person with CKD and type 1 diabetes? Age is less than 40, but then would you give this person a statin? LDL is 104. Yeah, many people say yes. Yeah, probably, I would, yes. So we have enough and more data that patients with chronic kidney disease, stage 3 and above, not patients on dialysis, but patients with CKD, they clearly benefit from statin therapy. Okay, so by and large, most of you would probably not treat this gentleman, isn't it? Who would actually treat him? But then, let's see what the guidelines would recommend, okay? So let's first look at what the ATP3 would have done. So if you estimate the risk in, in these four patients, so the first one, so his risk would be 9%. And then since, so that's like low or probably moderate, intent, moderate risk. So in moderate risk, you would only initiate therapy if the LDL cholesterol was over 130. So his is 74. So obviously, you would not give drug therapy if you followed the ATP3. Similarly, the other two. But then the fourth patient, the ATP3, said that patients with diabetes have a CHD risk equivalent, and therefore you would give treat, you would start them on a statin therapy. What about the new ACCHA recommendations? This is the estimated risk of this healthy pa patient. He's 68 years old, and only by virtue of being 68, this is what his risk is: 11.4 percent. He's well above the threshold of 7.5 percent. So if you followed these new dictates, then you would recommend drug therapy to him. Whereas the others who clearly you know is, you can, you can feel it in your gut that these are patients who are clearly at a higher risk. Their risk would be 3.1%, 7.4%, 1.2%. So the guidelines would almost say, no, don't treat them. Uh, you know, if you don't believe me, I've actually got the screenshots of these patients, okay? So this is it. So 11.4% for this patient, okay? And 3.1% for patient two. Welcome now to what the New York Times calls the calculator gate. Oh, sorry, why is it? Okay, so, you know, so uh, this is, um, so unfortunately we have to read so much about these guidelines from the New York Times, uh, even before it actually enters the the mainstream medical press. So, you know, they, um, that's what they call, this was the time when people were talking about the bridge gate, so they thought, oh, well, let's actually get into the calculator gate. And so Steve Nissen says it is stunning, that, and we need to pause to further evaluate this approach before it is implemented on a widespread basis. And, you know, what I want you to look at is look at the date. So this was an article that came on the 17th of November, and what they were talking about was about an article that was to come in the Lancet two days later. On November 19th was when this paper gets published in the Lancet. This is a paper by Steve Ritker and Cook. So what they looked at was they compared the actual event rates with the ACC AHA risk prediction algorithm. So like they looked at three different uh, uh, st studies, uh, epidemiological studies, the Women's Health Initiative, the Physician's Health Study, and the WHI Observational Study. And then what you see in red is the estimated risk by the new ACCHA para, uh, cohorts equation. And in the blue is the, is the real observed event rate. 
And what you can see is that across all these three different studies and across the different risk factor uh, groups, there is a consistent overestimation of the risk by, the new, uh, by this new prediction algorithm. And this is to a tune of 75 to 150%. So it almost, you would be doubling the estimated risk than what the actual risk is. And this they estimated would lead to like about 33 plus another 12 million middle-aged adults who would, be tre who would be recommended treatment because of this overestimation. I'm not so sure whether all this is true because you know it is always, yes, what happens is once you estimate the risk, there is going to be the treatment effect. So of course there will be some, diff some changes. But they raise another very interesting point, and I think that is uh, that should set us thinking. What is the utility of an algorithm after all? Okay, why do we even need to do this? Why do we need to estimate patients' risk after all? Do you know of a single lipid trial where patients were enrolled based on their estimated risk? No, none of them did that. So it was always like, oh, we, well, what are the inclusion criteria? Inclusion criteria: age so much, have an LDL cholesterol of this much, should have diabetes, or should have another risk factor, and so on. There is not a single drug trial which actually looked at where the inclusion criteria was, oh, estimated risk of 5 to 10 percent or over 10 percent or 20 percent and so on. So they go so far as to say that there is no real need for a global risk prediction score and that the guidelines should be based on trial data. That, you know, we should just say, oh, okay, this trial enrolled patients with this, 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 this in inclusion criteria. So we should therefore say that patients with that criteria will benefit from statin therapy. Now, I think that rises up in hornet's nest and we're not sure where to go. It's probably somewhere in between. And, uh, you know, this was actually more elegantly uh, uh, investigated by a more recent paper you might have seen in the New England Journal. It just came like a couple of weeks ago. So these are investigators from Duke, so Pensina and others. So they looked at what they wanted to do was, if you apply these new cholesterol guidelines to a population-based sample, so they took data from the enhanced, so they got like about 4,000 patients, and then they extrapolated this data to the, to the general U.S. population. And then they wanted to see how many patients would now qualify for statin therapy that would not have previously qualified for statin therapy. And uh, this is the gist of the paper. So they feel that, that they estimate that 12.8 million new patients would be eligible for statin therapy. And of these, 10.4 million, a vast majority of them would be for primary prevention. So it's interesting. So there are actually some, about 2 million people who, for who already have heart disease, who would not have qualified in the old guidelines simply because their LDL cholesterol was less than 100. But they would qualify also. And I think most people agree that probably that's not a bad idea. If you have patients with established heart disease, you would want to treat them with a statin. But it is this. So 10.4 million patients for primary prevention. And what is staggering is that of this, the vast majority is in the 60 to 75 age group. The median age of these patients is 65. And what is more striking is that their median LDL cholesterol is just 104. So if you adopt these guidelines, you will be treating a lot of older people with lower cholesterol. Uh, this is the, uh, the same numbers here. So if you look at the entire US adult population in 40 to 75 years, so through the, with the ATP3 criteria, about 40 million would, 45 million would require statin therapy. Whereas with the new ACCAHA, it's more like 55 million, it's about 14, 12 million more. But what is striking is if you look at the older adults, 60 to 75, in males, the percentage of these older adults who would be eligible for statin therapy would increase from about 30% to 85%. So 85% uh, of all adults aged 60 to 75 would probably, uh, would probably be eligible for statin therapy. In fact, if you say 65, then it would be almost 100%. You can play around with the risk calculator. If you enter 65, you can have the best lipids, but then your estimated risk will still be about 7.5%. And in females also, it's quite uh, striking, from about 20% to about 50%. 
So in summary, the pool cohorts equation, so this new risk estimator, it aims to provide a better estimate of the overall hard CVD events, including stroke. And it is a better risk estimate than the Framingham for women and African Americans. But there is some serious concern for risk overestimation, especially in the elderly. Now let's actually move on to primary prevention, okay? A little bit more about this. Now, you know, so this is probably the way we should do primary prevention. But then, you know, this might not be sufficient all the time. And uh, don't get me wrong, it's not that I don't believe in statins for primary prevention. Statins are clearly effective for primary prevention. Just look at the number needed to treat to prevent one uh, cardiovascular event over five years. So if you use Rosuva statin, this is data from the Jupiter, the number needed to treat is 29. And it, and it is very similar for other statins also. Voscops, Prevastatin, 44. Lower statin in AFCAPS is 49. Compare that with other seemingly established therapies, diuretics, 86, beta blockers, 140, aspirin that everybody takes without batting an eyelid, 346. That's the number needed to treat in men and women, it's 426. So are statins effective for primary prevention? Absolutely, okay, there's no doubt. Yes, and this is meta-analysis, you know, that has shown that no matter what the risk is, across a wide range of risk, less than 5%, 5 to 10%, 10 to 20%, whatever, giving a statin is beneficial than giving a placebo. And you might have seen this uh, slide also many times showing this linear relationship between reduction in LDL cholesterol and reduction in CHD events. This is in patients for secondary prevention. Okay, so here it is very striking. What about primary prevention? Primary prevention is also a linear relationship, but look at the difference between the two, and this is what most people fail to realize. While there is still a linear relationship, the, re the reduction in absolute risk is very minimal. Like for example, say if you reduce the cholesterol from say 150 to 90, for secondary prevention, you would be reducing the event rate from say what, from 17% to 5%. But what about primary prevention? So you would be reducing the event rate from 4% to probably 2%. So while it is true that statins will reduce the risk, the reduction in absolute risk would be very low in patients whose absolute risk for the disease is low to begin with. And we need to understand this before we become very belligerent with advocating statins for everybody for primary prevention. So uh, th this is what the panel recommends, as you know. So for everybody over 7.5%, and where did they get this 7.5%? So, what they did was they compared the cardiovascular event rates in the placebo group of all the major primary prevention trials. And then they looked at the adverse event rates from all the statin meta-analysis. And so at 7.5% ri risk, clearly the benefits outweighed the risk. And so that's why we have this recommendation to treat everybody at 7.5%. Because clearly at that risk level, the benefits far outweigh the risks. That's probably okay, but the main uh, issue I have with these guidelines is this. So they say that the benefits from statin therapy is uniform across a wide range of LDL cholesterol levels from 70 to 189, and that there is no evidence for a threshold. Where did they get this, uh, uh, get this information from? So this is again data from the CTT, the Cholesterol Treatment Trialist Collaboration. This is a huge collaboration. All they do is they pool together large, large amounts of data from multiple randomized controlled trials. And what they have essentially shown is that across different LDL cholesterol levels, okay, you will find that the benefit of statin therapy is uniform. So that there is, there seems to be a, there is no heterogeneity across all of these different LDL cholesterol levels. So if you have somebody whose LDL cholesterol is less than two millimoles, that is less than 80 milligrams per deciliter, 76 actually, 76 milligrams per deciliter, and you compare that with somebody who is greater than 3.5, that's greater than 170, they still seem to have more or less the same benefit from statin therapy. So this is why they say that you should not really look for an LDL threshold. But this is the problem with this. So what they have pooled here is data not just from primary prevention trials, but a large number of secondary prevention trials. Many patients with, and in fact, all of these trials with more versus less statin, these were done in patients with acute coronary syndromes. So we know that all of these patients 
start off with low LDL cholesterol levels. When somebody has an acute MI, their cholesterol is low and they do benefit from statin therapy. To pool that data together with primary prevention, I think is probably not right. If you look at just simply primary prevention trials, okay, so there are five major primary prevention trials that we have, the MEGA, the Jupiter, AFCOPS, ASCOT, and WASCOPS. What is the baseline LDL cholesterol in these patients? Look at this. These are the baseline LDL cholesterol. The lowest was in the Jupiter. And even here, this is 108. That was the median LDL cholesterol. So we really have no data at all on the efficacy of statins in patient for primary prevention in those whose LDL cholesterol is 70 to 100. None of these trials actually have examined them. Are statins effective in these patients? I don't know. Maybe they are. Okay. But then we don't have, on the basis of available data, I think it would be very hard to recommend statins for patients with an LDL cholesterol of 70 to 100. In fact, in one of these trials, the MEGA subgroup analysis actually shows that if you look at those whose LDL cholesterol is less than four, less than four is four times 40, 160, less than 150, they do not even derive any benefit from statin therapy. It is only those whose levels are more than 150 who derive a benefit. So I think we should be a little cautious about using statins for primary prevention in patients with low baseline LDL cholesterol. Next, I think we'll actually move a little bit about what about people with high LDL cholesterol but with seemingly low estimated risk, okay? Now, I love this slide, okay? There is no such thing as a sudden heart attack. It requires years of preparation, all right? And I, don't, I promised in the very outset that I won't say anything very inflammatory, but um, I just want to say this. You know, it's, it's all very right to say, to extol the virtues of randomized controlled trials, but we must understand that they have their own limitations. Most of these are sponsored by the pharmacological industry, and these are not really designed to answer critical clinical questions. They are really designed to get regulatory approval for the drug. And all of these are usually focused on drug therapy and not on lifestyle intervention, and the volunteers do not necessarily represent the patients that you and I see every day. So while we should look at data from RCTs, it is not to say that data from other sources is completely useless. A case in point is genetic data. Now, you might, those of you who have been following this field might have heard of this PCSK9. So this is the big thing, okay, that the in thing that everybody is talking about. So this is a new serine protease. So this is an enzyme which, which uh, you know, j j just for simplicity, the main function of this enzyme is to chew up the LDL receptor. So if you have a lot of this PCSK9, it chews up your LDL receptor, so you don't have enough LDL receptors recycling to the surface of the hepatocyte, so you're not able to clear your LDL particles, and you will get more LDL cholesterol. Whereas on the other hand, if you get a loss of function, if for some reason this PCSK9 is silenced, then the LDL receptor is very happy, it escapes, it goes back to the surface of the hepatocyte, clears up all the LDL particles, and you end up with low LDL cholesterol. What is the significance of this? Is it all just simply theoretical conjecture? No, not at all. So when you have patients, these are, this is data from the ERIC and the Dallas Heart Study. So those patients who have a variant of the PCSK9 that inactivates this, you see that there is a moderate reduction in LDL cholesterol of about say 28 to 40%. But this is extremely staggering. Look at the reduction in CHD risk in these patients, 88%. None of our statin therapy, the most intensive statin therapy, at best it can cause a 30-40% relative risk reduction. Whereas here, even with moderate but lifelong LDL cholesterol reduction, we can really bend the curve. We can change, the, we can drastically reduce the CHD risk. I think this represents a paradigm shift that, you know, we should probably intervene early and even if it is gentle intervention, if we can reduce the overall lifelong LDL burden, then we might be more favorably influencing CHD event rates. So th th I think that's something that, uh, uh, that should be borne in mind. So in summary about primary prevention, statins are clearly effective for primary prevention, but there is little evidence in people with LDL cholesterol less than 100 and we must actually look at epidemiological and genetic evidence which favors lowering LDL burden in the long run. Now, uh, I'll spend about five minutes on diabetes, okay? So I'd, actually, I think 
uh, since we don't have uh, audience response, I won't spend too much time on this. So the point was this, okay? So which of these patients when di would you do? So if you have somebody who is 42 years old, newly diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, um, would you start a statin? I, I think I'll skip this, okay? So I just we'll just go into what, what is the point that I wanted to make here. So the point again is this. So it's the same thing with primary prevention in patients with diabetes as well. So we have these meta-analysis which shows that patients with diabetes, they derive the same benefit as patients without diabetes on any endpoints, and that this risk is independent of their LDL cholesterol level, so which is why they again give these broad sweeping recommendations about treating everybody with an LDL cholesterol about 70 for diabetes. But again, the same thing. If you look at all the different trials where this data comes from, there are only four of these trials which included a significant number of patients with diabetes. All others are like 1%, 2%, 8% patients with diabetes. The, the only trial which is really worthwhile is the CARDS. So CARDS was a study. These were the four trials. And of these four, CARDS was the trial which actually showed a benefit. ASCOT and ALHART did not even show a benefit with statin therapy in diabetics. HPS and CARDS were the two trials. The HPS, as you know, great study, but then this included patients who were at very high cardiovascular risk. These were patients who already had heart disease and at a high risk. And what about CARDS? CARDS was a primary prevention trial, okay? Great trial. So, you know, it was stopped early because of a 37% event reduction. I don't want you to go into the details. Just look at the baseline characteristics of these patients. Duration of diabetes, 7.8 years. Mean LDL cholesterol at baseline, 115. Non-HDL cholesterol, 152. To me, these are the patients who will clearly benefit from statin therapy. My type 2 diabetic that I just see today, six, you know, six months of, this, uh, of diagnosis of diabetes, I don't know whether you need to start therapy immediately. Maybe you need to because he has a high lifetime risk. But what if his LDL, non-HDL cholesterol is 100? I don't know whether he'll really benefit from that. We don't have any evidence for that. Um, but that is still iffy. Here is something that I really uh, am disappointed with the new guidelines. I think they missed the point about not recommending non-HDL cholesterol. Okay, So we have enough and more data to show that non-HDL cholesterol is superior to LDL cholesterol in predicting CHD risk. If you look at any LDL cholesterol across any level of LDL cholesterol, increasing non-HDL cholesterol it indicates greater risk, whereas the same is not true for non-HDL cholesterol. Across any non-HDL cholesterol, increasing LDL cholesterol does not predict greater risk. Further, if you look at what is the best indicator that, that will indicate to you the efficacy of a treatment, it is again non-HDL cholesterol. Changes in non-HDL cholesterol, they explain the changes in the, the benefit of a treatment rather than changes in LDL cholesterol or FOB. And uh, to, to not even mention anything about non-HDL cholesterol, I think, in these guidelines was a disappointment. And another thing is they, they discourage the addition of fibrates and other therapy to statins. Well, I think that there is a role for combination therapy in select individuals, while in general, most of the add-on fibrate therapies did not show benefit. If you actually look at the relative risk reduction across these different fibrate trials, only one or two of them were significant. This is in the whole group. But if you look at the subgroup of patients who have high triglycerides, you will see that almost all of these trials showed that there was a benefit. So in selected patients, the addition of fibrate to statin is probably beneficial. So this is the, I'll end here, okay? I want to throw out a number at you, 19. And I wish I had this thing. So what do you think 19 is? Okay, Is this the number of recommendations in the guidelines, the number of evidence statements, the number of meta-analysis referenced, the number of times that the term patient preference appears in the manuscript, or the number of times the term treatment goals appear in the manuscript? What do you think this is? C. Uh, C? No, it's actually D. Okay. I think this is probably the, the strongest point. The thing that I like most about these guidelines is this. So they, there are 19 times that they use the term patient preference appears in this manuscript. 
Okay, so they really lay a very strong emphasis on involving the patient in start in before you make a recommendation. And at the Mayo Clinic, we are all for this. We actually use this statin decision aid, and this is how we actually deal with most of our patients. So uh, you can act, but please go to this uh, website, and you will find that this is very useful. So what I do with all my patients is, so I enter all their risk factors and then you know like for example for this patient so it turns out that without any treatment this is his risk so i tell you 100 amongst 100 people like you 41 are likely to have a heart attack if you start on high intensity statin therapy then it will be 25 so 16 people would be saved from heart attack if you start a statin would you want to take a statin of course here it's very clear but whereas in many of these primary preventions it will turn out that Oh, if you start taking a statin from four, it becomes two or it becomes three. And then, you know, so the patient and you can make a meaningful decision about whether or not to take, uh, to start drug therapy. So in summary, what's good in these new guidelines? I think it simplifies lipid treatment in patients with CHD and those with very high LDL cholesterol. There is no need to adjust therapy to reach arbitrary goals. We don't have to just add on Zetia simply because the LDL cholesterol is 104 and not 99. And then there's a very strong emphasis on patient clinician conversation. Importance of lifestyle modification is stressed. And there are also some simplified guidelines for follow-up of patients on statin therapy. What's bad? I think the main problem is that statin therapy for patients with high estimated global risk but low cholesterol levels. So these recommendations for primary prevention in patients with LDL cholesterol in the 70 to 100 range, I think are quite controversial. And there is not enough emphasis on utilizing long-term risk assessment in younger subjects. Clearly there is risk overestimation in the elderly. There is no recommendation to assess risk using non-HDL cholesterol. And it's a little vague and ambiguous about add-on therapies and expected therapeutic response. What's ugly? Now, I actually left this slide blank intentionally. I really don't think that there is anything particularly ugly about it. I, in fact, the only ugly thing that I noticed about this whole episode was people actually coming out in the New York Times. And I want to use my New York Times to read about uh, bridge gate and not calculator gate. I think we should be involved in an academic discussion on how best to further patients. And uh, uh, I don't think it's about, we should, you know, some of the innuendos that have been cast that, you know, the panel members were all influenced by commercial interests. And I don't think any of that is true. I just think that this is an academic debate and we should leave it there. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to take it. What is your feeling about uh, niacin therapy and low HDL? Well, um, as add-on to statins, it is probably not, uh, I would not favor that. We have at least had two large trials, both the HPS Thrive and the AIM High, which did not show any benefit in patients who are already on maximally tolerated statin therapy. However, if I have a patient who is intolerant of statins, or perhaps in patients who have a high uh, LP little a or a low HDL, I still use niacin, but not as a routine, certainly not as an add-on to maximal tolerated statin therapy. Question about your uh, patient recommendations for diet, uh, saturated fat versus polyunsaturated versus monounsaturated fat. What do you tell patients? Are there any good fats out there? Uh, are there any good fats? Yes, certainly. So the idea is to get saturated fats to below 7 to 10 percent. So yes, so we encourage a lot of uh, um, uh, the monounsaturated fats, so fish. Uh, now, we don't really recommend fish oil supplements, but then dietary increasing fish consumption to at least three times a week. And then as also the other plant-based fats, so uh, yes, so getting it up to about 30% of the uh, of the ca calories through fat, mainly mono and polyunsaturated fat, is good. So I think uh, when the guidelines came initially, they were um, uh, kind of stressing on two statins, the Lipitor and the Crestor. I think when they initially published, but it's, is it 
I mean, um, has it changed now? And um, because I think if I remember correctly, that's what they were kind of uh, uh, mentioning those two statins, you know, being studied in most trials. And well, they didn't really uh, mention the name of the statins. Their thing was high intensity statin. And so the only ones which cause high intensity would be those two. So that's probably the way it goes. Okay. The, uh, the second question is um, some of the patients ask about the, you know, the recent developments about high dose uh, statins causing diabetes. What would be the answer for that? I think that's a genuine concern, okay? So uh, the risk of developing diabetes is about one in 1,000, okay? So in, uh, it's actually uh, it's, uh, probably more than like one in 3,000 if you use moderate dose statin, whereas in high dose, it's almost like one in 1,000. So, and this seems to occur mostly in people who already have impaired fasting glucose. So if you already have baseline glucose abnormalities, it is more likely that you develop diabetes. So I think it's all a question of balancing the cardiovascular risk versus the risk of developing diabetes. So if I have somebody whose uh, fasting plasma glucose is 120 and whose estimated cardiovascular risk is 5%, then you know I would be hesitant to give him a statin. Whereas if I have somebody who is glucose is 110, but cardiovascular risk is 12%, 15%, then clearly I would give them a statin. Even though they might develop diabetes, the, 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 uh, the, the benefit they derive from statin outweighs that risk. Could you also comment about the role of um, apoproteins and apoproteins B uh, in the US? Yeah, so the apo B, so there is a lot of uh, uh, interest about using uh, other markers such as apo B. And well, anyway, the long and short is this. I don't think it is prime time yet for ApoB. So is ApoB a good correlation? Does it correlate well with cardiovascular risk? Absolutely. But what is the incremental benefit of using ApoB? That's very minimal. And especially many of the studies have shown that non-HDL is superior to ApoB also. So I only use non-HDL. I don't use ApoB. What uh, percentage of people do you find are not able to stick with the statins over the long term? Uh, uh, <clears throat> and stop it because of the uh, side effects. Yes, at least between effect. 5 to 10 percent. So, uh, so this was investigated by the PRIMO study, so where they looked at uh, the uh, number of people who, this was of course a patient-filled uh, questionnaire, and so it, it varied across the different statins. So with simvastatin, it was anywhere between 15 to 20 percent who complained of muscle adverse effects, but not that all of them could not tolerate it. I think the number of people who could discontinue is much less, maybe le like about 5% or so. But it is clearly much more than what the studies show, you know, like rhabdo is only one in 10,000 and so on. So that's, that's probably the selected patients in these trials who have a pre-run and so on. In the general run of the mill patients, it is much higher, at least 5%. Thank you very much.